Uh, welcome everybody. I have uh, two guests with me today. I'd like to publicize and share the work that they're both doing or their experiences in Lebanon, which is in the Middle East and is an Arabic speaking country. So the first person to my huh, left, potentially, I don't know how this video is going to come out, is Mark. He's the guy that you can actually see. He's a pastor in Lebanon, an American. Um, and the other gentleman that we have with us is a Christian Arabic speaker, a native uh, Lebanese guy who I'd like to also talk to. So without further ado, really, um, I'm going to put all this stuff in the description box. And I'd like to ask Mark, firstly, um, could you tell us a bit about your testimony, how the Lord led you to Lebanon and how you found your uh, time there as a minister? <clears throat> Well, um, like she said, my name is Mark, Mark Starin, uh, originally from New York. And uh, 1975, the Civil War started in Lebanon. And I have many relatives here. My mother's parents came from Lebanon. My grandfather left in 1904, and, uh, but always had a special place for Lebanon. And as a child, I used to love to sit next to my grandfather and listen to the stories of the old country. So I came to the Lord in 1972. And uh, when the Civil War started in Lebanon in 75, I felt a very strong burden to pray for the country, <clears throat> especially to pray for my relatives, not knowing them, but knowing I have relatives. I was praying one evening. And there was an amazing calling that, that, that God gave. He, first, I, I saw a field of people, and they were falling dead one after another. I cried out to the Lord, and I said, but God, they're souls. When I said that, I stood in the middle of the field. And as one was falling over, I reached out with my right hand, I grabbed them, I pulled them up, another one was falling with my left hand over and over again. The voice of God spoke to me and said, you will go to the land of your people and preach. Those exact words. Probably about six months later, we're in a very powerful uh, church service. One of my friends came up to me and said, God just spoke to me and said, you are going to go to the land of your people and preach. Then a few months later, we're in a special Monday prayer and fast in the church. And we're praying, we're fasting, the whole congregation. Uh, this was an amazing church that I was a member of because uh, when it was prayer meeting time, everybody showed up. Whoever was there Sunday morning was there Wednesday Bible study and prayer meeting. And as we were praying and fasting, the Lord spoke with tongues and interpretation. A man stood up in the congregation. He started walking down the aisle, prophesying to the church, and then he turned. And he walked and came behind me. I'm sitting in the front pew. He put his right hand on my left shoulder, and prophesied things that were between me and God. They were nothing wrong, nothing personal, but just prayers I prayed to God. And then he said, you will go to the land of your people and preach. So God said it the same exact way three times. This, this is how great God is. He, he, he confirms everything. So 19... 77, I came to Lebanon for the first time, and I was here for five months to confirm my call. I was still a, a young man at that time in my, uh, my mid-20s, and as I was here, I, uh, I, I, had, I was staying in one of my cousin's home, and uh, my cousin's wife's brother was in a very bad auto accident, and he was driving and his wife was sitting in the passenger side and a car came very fast and plowed into them, right, right into her. So the man had a broken right leg, but his wife was completely damaged on the right side. And she was released from the hospital and we're all staying in the, in the same apartment there in, in, uh, in the Biblos, Jebel area of Lebanon. 
And every day she would have a therapist that would come to her. And they told her that she will walk someday, but there will be a severe limp because the whole right side, right on the hip was completely destroyed. So all those tissues are going to be damaged and shrunk. So she'll have a severe limp, but she will be able to walk. One day they asked me to pray. So I prayed. I placed my right hand on her forehead and said a, a small prayer in Jesus' name. And the very next day, when the therapist came, he rolled back the covers. He looked, he stared, and he started shouting. I'm in the next room, I hear this. He shouts, what happened, what happened, what happened, what happened? He, he looked at the woman, what happened to you, what happened to you, what happened to you? Turned to the other, what happened to her? And they said, what's the matter, doctor? He said, many, many, many months of healing had taken place overnight. What happened to her? They dropped their mouth and they said, Mark prayed yesterday. She walks today without a limp. God completely restored her. Some months later, I, I went on a trip, came back to Lebanon. I was very sick, put in the hospital, given two weeks to live. And I uh, had lost a lot of weight, very sick. And uh, at that time, 6,000 miles away in my home church in Schenectady, New York, they felt to pray for me. They didn't know why. And they prayed. There was tongues and interpretation. And God told them that I was suffering, but that he will raise me up. And this will strengthen me to be uh, the man of God that he wants me to be. So God completely healed me from the hepatitis. So I am out of the hospital. And I'm having coffee actually with the therapist that, that uh, had done work with my, 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 my cousin's uh, uh, wife there. And so he's sitting there and he looks at me. He says, I have no idea why you're alive. I looked at him. I smiled and I said, I know why. He says, I know what you're going to tell me. And we, we have seen many miracles coming to Lebanon. And that same house that I told you about, uh, 1995, my cousin in that house, at that time he was a retired general in the Lebanese army, my mother's first cousin. He died of a massive heart attack. They rushed him to the hospital and because he was a general, they had the best doctors working on him. And they got him alive only on the machines. He was in a deep coma. And uh, one day the Lord told me to go and pray for him and that he would heal him. So I said, no. I, I didn't know how I was going to get into that ward because it was locked. But then I thought and I prayed. And I said, Lord, there's a, a doctor in that hospital that I'm giving Bible studies to. I want to see him. And I want him to get me in. So I went to the hospital, saw the doctor, and I just said, doctor, I have to pray for the general now. He took out his keys, opened up that ward. We walked in. My cousin, there's a room with about three patients there, and they're all in comas and monitors. And the doctor said, this is Reverend Mark. Let him do whatever he wants. So I go over to my cousin. I placed my right hand on his forehead. I prayed in Jesus' name. And as I'm praying, tears started coming down his eyes. So when I went home, I asked my wife, she's a, a nurse, I said, what does that mean? She says, one of two things. Either fluids are rushing because he's going to die, or the Lord healed him. Well, within a few hours, there was new activity on the machines. In two days, he was out of the coma, and in two weeks, he walked out of the hospital. And when all the doctors were saying, this is impossible, the general should be dead or a vegetable, one doctor said, I know what happened to the general. When the reverend prayed for him, 
Jesus healed him. That's why we are here, because there are many people who have great needs. And we are here to preach the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And with it comes miracles and healing. And I could tell much more, but I know that we have limited time, so I'll turn it back over to you. But if there's ever a time you want to hear more, because we have so many miracles that are happening here, and we thank God. Uh, our church is located in Jebel Biblos, and uh, they'll probably put the information up. And I want to thank you for an opportunity to, to share my burden and calling with you. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Mark. You sounded a bit like uh, John in John's Gospel at the end there. There's many more books that you could fill, um, and please, God, we'll yeah. be able to come back together soon. So I guess um, my next question is directed to our other guest, and I have grown up as a Christian or a cultural Christian, depending on which era in my life I look to, in a Western country, where Christianity is uh, allegedly at least the state religion um, and, and is promoted as such. But I guess I, like there's a heavy Islamic presence now, but I just would like to know, I guess, what it's like to grow up as a Christian in a land that is on paper, maybe half, half Islamized and half Christianized um, and whether that translates into the streets or into your home. So second guest, would you mind, uh, giving us like a, your testimony as a, as a Christian in Lebanon. Sure, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me first. Uh, what a beautiful testimony, uh, Brother Mark. Uh, I wanna say we're desperate for those miracles here in Lebanon and for more actually. Uh, the question you asked me, uh, Sister Kay, is a very important question. Because, uh, yeah, the whole world knows that uh, my country is on papers half-half between, shared between Muslims and Christians. But uh, the way it is uh, on the ground is, is uh, totally the opposite, not different, totally the opposite. If we, uh, if we bring up few cases like uh, the train the official train company we have on papers an official uh, train company that have uh, employees on papers that get real payrolls paychecks every month uh, none of them is a christian and let me tell you that since 1978 or 80 we have no train and those people are still on the payroll getting paid from the taxes i pay every time i want to feed my kids i pay taxes for the government this money goes towards those people for example some other form of jizya that i pay on uh, in reality not on papers if you go to the west side 70 percent of the people doesn't pay the hydro bill the electricity bill while you come to my area we pay it in double and triple we pay a very high uh, bill for the electricity so we are paying for us and them not on papers under the table everything everything else goes the same in the same systematic way we are paying jizya we are being oppressed under the table and on top of the table as they say uh, when they try if you look back in a little bit in the history of my country we had numerous real wars with them yeah. and uh, this this never never went good went good in the in the country never resulted in a in a good uh, in a good result so now we're still in the country they are getting more in numbers 
we are uh, leaving the country uh, and getting less in numbers. As you see, no job opportunities whatsoever. If there is any, it wouldn't be for us. And to be honest, if I have one more minute to speak about our politicians Please. and our leaders, uh, the 50% that we brag about as Christians here in Lebanon that we have, most of them, to be fair, most of them, meaning more than 90%, I'm speaking here, they work for the Muslims. Meaning I would have a minister or a, a deputy or any kind of Christian position in the, in the government to, uh, to protect me or to uh, bring out my, uh, my words to the public. But I cannot trust that because this person will not be a true Christian. So that's the situation in reality. Okay, so for anybody who's not familiar with the term jizya, um, it's, uh, it's discerned from the Quran, which is the uh, sacred scripture of Islam. And it, in verse or Surah 9, Ayah 29, it says, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger nor acknowledge the religion of truth even if they are of the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued or humiliated depending on the uh on the translation because unfortunately mm -hmm. we see that westernized translations are not always completely accurate mm -hmm. um, in their delivery yeah. to Christians who are very well-meaning in the West, but unfortunately don't understand um, the reality of living in uh, a country so divided as yours. What I'd like to thank you for is that, uh, that description, which is, I hope that uh, at least people in maybe America, Australia, Great Britain and Europe would see that, uh, as our second guest says, uh, if Christians leave the country to which they're born and if more Muslims obviously just by birth rate and, and traveling are, are enabled and protected and facilitated to be able to have jobs thereby being able to feed themselves as opposed to you know second class citizenship um, the situation can only really go towards other uh, completely Islamic countries that we see today and uh, we hear the tales from the asylum seekers from those countries when they come to Christ so that being said what a great thing that mark uh was going in the opposite direction from the outflow of christians and has been able uh as we've heard and i'd like to hear some more um seen some actual miracles going on in his own life i believe if i'm not mistaken that you've had situations where you've prayed for muslims and they've also been delivered from uh, some affliction so would you mind uh, just telling us about that and if your church is maybe close to a muslim area or how that how the logistics work of that please mark we're in a predominantly christian area but there are muslims in our area but um we seem to have a a good relationship with the muslims in, in our area we had uh, uh let's see this was 2003 we had some muslims coming to the church and uh, they, they received the Holy Spirit. And it was just amazing. And one lived two and a half hours away. So when he drove home, he got there two and a half hours later, he walked in the front door and his mother looked at his face. It, it, was, it was just beaming, it was glowing. And she said, son, whatever you have, I want it. So the next Sunday, she came to church with him. She was completely, she had all arthritis in her shoulders. We prayed for her. Immediately, she was healed and she could raise her hands. Could not do that before. So the next Sunday, we had more Muslims coming from two and a half hours away needing healing. They, they were coming. They were getting prayed for. 
they were getting healed. When I went to their area, this one woman got on the telephone. She called up some of her neighbors in five minutes. Her living room was full of people who wanted me to place my hand on their head and to pray in the name of Jesus. So we, we have witnessed many miracles and people have been healed, people have been delivered. And um, so, uh, and that's just, just a few uh, of the many miracles that we have seen. We have seen people just, just coming to church. I remember this one man, he was from, uh, from North Syria. He was a very hard Muslim. And he asked somebody in our church, he said, give me one verse from the Old Testament that shows the two natures of Christ. You say he's got a human and a divine. Give me one scripture. So the man came to me and I said, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Unto us the child is given, the son is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So here we see both the human and the divine nature. So when he told the man, he decided to come to church. And we were going to have a special prayer meeting one night. And so I was driving around and telling people we're going to have a special prayer meeting in the church on Thursday night. And this man was there. He said, I'm coming tomorrow. And he was kind of a little bit cold. But, you know, he says, I, I need something and I want you to pray for me. I said, okay. So he came the next day. And I went over and I started praying for him. And, and he, he just opened up to the Lord. He started weeping and praying and thanking the Lord. He told me after, he said, he said, this is the second time in my life I've ever cried. He said, when I was a little boy, I was injured, I cried. But, but after that, I would be strong. I wouldn't cry. One time the army, they caught me and they were beating me with rods and I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't budge. I wouldn't flinch. I'm strong. I can take it. He said, but when you laid your hand and prayed for me, the, the warmth, the love of the Lord just came in and filled. And, and he said, I just started weeping. It was so beautiful. When you see people that turn from being so hard against this to opening up their heart. Jesus has a river of love to give, a river of blessings. He has his love, which there is nothing in the world that can compare to his love. So th these are a few of the many miracles that that we had seen. I guess, Mark, that at this point, I'd like to say to the family who are watching, which is Soko Films in the main channel and in mine, that uh, some of the blessings that I would love us to be able to help Mark's ministry with would be if any of us have maybe a half an hour a week or some uh, tech skills or uh, ways to promote his ministry to really draw attention to the great work that he's doing. He's there, he's able to minister to Christians and Muslims alike. And as we see, he is only one man. He has his wife, obviously, to support him. But what I feel uh, called to do at this point is to really, I'm gonna look towards some funding options, maybe just to get a camera or something whereby his website can be populated with testimonies and, uh, worship of the one god and to be a shining light to lebanon really because the rest of the world unfortunately what we hear about the middle east is mainly strife mainly hezbollah related and uh you know oil and money and maybe israel's problems but when i grew up actually the the term downtown beirut was used as a joke which it not a joke but it was a a descriptor if there was a fight going on in, in the street or if there was some rough crowd it would be you know described it's like downtown Beirut over there 
but never once, I'm ashamed to say, did I ever think about anybody living in downtown Beirut. So with that, we've got about five minutes left before um, our time runs out. So I'd like to hand back over to our second guest. I think maybe I, oh, I, I, I already unmuted. Um, yeah, so I'd like to give him an opportunity just, uh, I don't know if he would like to speak about the things that he would like to see for Lebanon. I'll just leave it open really. Uh, second guest, do you have anything that you'd like to add before we, we wrap up for now? But I'm sure we will be back all together soon. Yes, I want to add uh, that we we definitely need uh, the miracles that uh, Pastor Mark is uh, talking about for us to stop fighting with each other and uh, for them to stop trying to make me pay jizya while I'm humiliated as it comes in their book and for them to come to the light of Christ and find men like Pastor Mark to show them the light, the real light of, of Jesus, so we can live all in this country as sisters and brothers. Please God, that happens. So I'm reminded that as Christians, uh, all three of us, and for sure, almost everybody watching when this goes out, um, we must pray for our brothers and we must pay, pray for our enemies. And I don't see Muslims as my enemies one bit, I see that in Romans, uh, we are told that those who God knows, he will predestine them. They will, their names are already written. We don't know who God has chosen and therefore we preach to all nations. We try to make disciples of all men um, and that includes Muslims. Uh, I'd like to invite any Muslims listening to Christ. I'd like them to just please take a second to look into the Bible if you want to think it's corrupted, maybe you should read it yourself and see if it, uh, if it moves your heart. And if you sincerely and earnestly pray for the light of God to shine into your heart, then uh, I'm pretty sure you'll come to see that, uh, that Christ is pretty glorious. So with that, Mark, I'll give you the last word. We have like maybe a minute before our time runs out. But uh, Actually, I'll give you the last word and then I have the last, last word because that's the kind of okay. girl I am. But over to you. Okay, I just want to say, in our church, we have people from all different backgrounds. We don't discriminate. If somebody's a Muslim and they come in, don't worry. You can come in and you're at home in our church. We just love Jesus together. That's absolutely beautiful. And with that, family, uh, I'll see you in the live chat where I'll be moderating, I'm sure. And uh, I'll be back with some more. And hopefully, JC will be uh, here also speaking to Mark and our second guest pretty soon. So God bless you all. And uh, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. It's never a chore. Thank you both so much. <laughs>